Um, uh, when we were, um, we were looking around to fill our last uh, speaker slot for today, Julia, one of our organizers, mentioned Samir Halai. Uh, and uh, so I started reading up on Samir's company, Sunfunder, and I was definitely intrigued. And then I met Samir in person and got a chance to see a preview of the talk that you guys are going to see today, and I was incredibly impressed with his thoughtfulness. What more power than rat? Mr. <laughs> With, uh, with Samir's Red thoughtfulness and intelligence. And um, I, I know you guys are going to enjoy this next presentation. So Samir is the co-founder and chief design Rocky. officer of SunFunder. Uh, and as he'll tell you in a minute, he's also an information nerd. He's one of us. Please welcome to the stage Samir Halai. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, guys. Thanks for being here. I know it's like nice and sunny outside, and, and we all have like, what are you going to do next, right? Like, I'm thinking about that too, but so this, is, this should be hopefully worth it. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, uh, I grew up in, uh, in India, in Mumbai. Uh, for 24 years, I was there. I moved here uh, nine years ago um, to complement my uh, degree in computer engineering that I had in India, and I moved here to an iSchool uh, in Michigan. So I know there are a few iSchoolers here. And anyone here from high school in Michigan, though? Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I did that. I got uh, my uh, master's in HCI and social computing, which happened to be like, um, I guess I was one of the first batch of social computing. It was fun because uh, HCI was more about uh, you know, user uh, at an individual level with interfaces and technology. And social computing was more about looking at society as a whole at a macro level, and then kind of seeing how that interacts with technology and information systems. So it was really fun. I really nodded out on that. And uh, then I moved here to Seattle for working at Microsoft, which I don't know how many else, who else has done that? Uh, it's quite a common story. <laughs> Amazon, Microsoft, right? Yeah, that's what brings us here. I didn't know where Seattle was on the map uh, before I actually came here, so it was fun. Uh, I was on the Windows uh, team for some time. Uh, then I was at uh, an incubation lab called uh, Future Social Experiences, where uh, we basically worked with big data, social tools, and trying to like incubate new ideas within Microsoft, trying to make Microsoft more social. And uh, that was fun too, right? Um, then I joined a startup uh, in Bellevue called Limeade, uh, where we're doing health and uh, well-being. It was corporate wellness programs, making it fun to focus on your well-being, um, making people healthier, and companies save money doing that. And that was my first experience with um, creating like these win-win-win systems where, you know, like people are better off using, you know, gamifying health. They they got healthier. Companies uh, saved money, and we made money enabling that. So it was fun. And uh, I was the director of user experience there, so it was really like a fun user experience-y, uh, startup -y world. Um, but I knew I wanted to work in the development sector. I wanted to be in international development, and that's how I ended up uh, with SunFunder. So I ran to some people, and we kind of you know, ended up with this company. So um, these are the hashtags. I know some people have been tweeting. Make sure you stay consistent with the, uh, with the tags we use here. Um, <clears throat> so let's actually start by understanding what we do. Uh, like, what is this off-grid solar? Before I started, I had no idea what it was. Uh, it's fun. Here are some numbers. Um, two and a half billion people around the world don't have enough electricity, right? So that's like one in three people around the world. Um, I didn't know that uh, until I saw this. So 1.3 billion people have no electricity at all. Like, they, you know, if you watch Downton Abbey, um, you've seen like when, like 100 years ago, they get electricity. There's still 1.3 billion people that don't have it, right? They have never switched on. They don't have that. Um, and when you look at people that do have something, they're on the grid, uh, but they have you know, maybe four hours of electricity, or they have blackouts, brownouts all the time. And that's getting worse. Like We don't have enough energy for the energy needs that we need. So it's a huge global problem, access to electricity. Um, the other fact, this is a two-year-old stat. It's probably changed. Now you know there's about 5 billion, 6 billion cell phones, and 10% of them uh, don't have a way of actually being charged. So that's kind of the other thing. There's this whole information access thing going on, uh, but there's no access to electricity, so that's limited again. Uh, so that's the landscape that we are in. Um, these are some sad numbers in a way. One, the poorest one-fifth spends one-fifth of the energy uh, expenses, but they only get 0.1% of the lighting, right? Um, so a lot of inequality on how people access the same things for the same amount of money. Uh, and that's when these uh, regions, diesel and kerosene, really dominate. Like, that's what you see. So 2.5 billion people are using diesel and kerosene every day uh, to complement their energy and lighting needs. 
and that has effects, right? Um, if you are using fossil fuels, you have effects on your health, um, which kind of is obvious. Just put one number out there, just the pollution from kerosene, not fires, just pollution, kills 1.5 billion people every year. Uh, it creates barriers to information access. This is, uh, by the way, most of the pictures here uh, are taken by me as we have been doing a lot of work. Uh, to, uh, there's a whole storytelling component to what we do. So this is very common. This was in uh, Kenya, where uh, you walk into a village and there's a phone charging station. You walk up to this person, he has gone to a nearest town, filled up car batteries with electricity, brought it to the village, and now you walk up to this person, pay him money, walk around without a phone for a few hours, and uh, then it's charged, and then you go home. Uh, and this person, this is his business, that's how he makes money. And uh, people are spending a day to charge their phones, right? Not like what we do. Uh, there's lack of um, not having electricity creates barriers to safety and security. Um, something kind of hard to conceive, but uh, like I chose this picture because it shows, this is a solar street lamp um, on the right, on the right, yeah. <laughs> and um, you can see the sharp fall off in what happens, right? Uh, you know, this is daylight in one place and then the other, other places are just dark. So um, there are lots of uh, things that happen, like kids cannot be outside when it's dark, women cannot go to the bathroom when it's dark, lots of things happen because of that. When people get access to lighting, uh, if they have two lights, the, what they do is one's inside the home and one's outside the home. Because when you have light outside your home, you feel safe. Um, so it really like, creates uh, that sense of safety and security. Um, this is an example where, um, this was a village in, um, in West Kenya where, um, you know, there's a village market at night, and it's 6 p.m., it's dark, um, so people have to hold flashlights under the chin uh, to do business, right? So you walk up to this uh, woman, and you're like, okay, I want to buy tomatoes, and then in the dark, you're looking at these things and dishing out money, and the chain's wrong and stuff like that. And there was a woman next to her who fortunately happened to be always sitting under the side of a new solar street lamp, and now she's like, my business is 10x. Everyone comes to me because, you know, I'm lit up. So... Um, the GDP goes up when you have access to electricity. You can see that. There's more cycles for doing more business. Um, I chose this example because we all know these people and um, kind of shows um, something uh, interesting about uh, how hard it is to conceive some of these things. I'm just going to play a short video. The parents, um, um, they invited us to come and stay in their BOMA. Uh, actually, the goats had been there, I think, living in that particular little hut on their little compound before we got there. And we stayed with their family, and we really, really learned what life is like in rural Tanzania. And the difference between just going and visiting for half a day or, you know, three quarters of a day versus staying overnight was profound. And so let me just give you one explanation of that before we got there. They had six children, and as I talked to Anna in the kitchen, we cooked for about five hours. Life is like in rural Tanzania. And the difference between just going and visiting for half a day or, you know, three quarters of a day versus staying overnight was profound. And so let me just explain. Is the same video playing twice? Okay. It's still playing somewhere, right? A host video from somewhere. All right, there you go. Good catch. Okay. Okay, we'll use this UI and find the video again. All right. We decided to go spend two nights and three days with a family. Uh, Anna and Sonari are the parents. Um, they invited us to come and stay in their boma. Uh, actually, the goats had been there, I think, living in that particular little hut on their little compound before we got there. And we stayed with their family, and we really, really learned what life is like in rural Tanzania. And the difference between just going and visiting for half a day or, you know, three quarters of a day versus staying overnight was profound. And so let me just give you one explanation of that. 
They had six children, and as I talked to Anna in the kitchen, we cooked for about five hours in the cooking hut that day. And as I talked to her, she had absolutely planned and spaced with her husband the births of their children. It was a very loving relationship. This was a Maasai warrior and his wife, but they had decided to get married. They clearly had respect and love in the relationship. Their children, their six children, the two in the middle were twins, 13, a boy and a girl named Grace. And when we go out to chop wood and do all the things that Grace and her mother would do, Grace was not a child; she was an adolescent, but she wasn't an adult. She was very, very shy. So she kept wanting to talk to me and Jen. We kept trying to engage her, but but she was shy.、Hmm. And at night, though, when all the lights went out in rural Tanzania, and there was no moon that night, the first night, and no stars, and Jen came out of our hut with her REI little headlamp on. Grace went immediately and got the translator. Came straight up to my Jen and said, "When you go home, can I have your headlamp so I can study at night?" Oh wow! <laughs> and her dad had told me how afraid he was that, unlike the son who'd passed his secondary exams because of her chores, she'd not done so well and wasn't in the government school yet. He was. He said, "I don't know how I'm going to pay for her education. I can't pay for private school, and she may end up on this farm like my wife." So they know the difference that an education can make in a huge, profound way.、Uh, so this has been like very interesting to、uh, understand. You know that. They've been doing development work for a while,、uh, but this is really new and this is very recent. Actually, spending a night in a place and seeing what it's like to not have electricity and understanding the impact of that is profound. And I was very humbled when I did that too. And we have seen examples where, like, teachers cannot prepare lessons at night; they cannot grade assignments at night. It's like all the things we take for granted you cannot do because you only have limited daylight.、Um, And cell phones are everything. This is an example where、uh, this was in Uttar Pradesh in India, and、uh, this guy was showing me his phone that they use、uh, to watch movies together. So six people share that screen and watch a movie together, right? At night, it's bright enough to do that. And these phones are louder than any phones you have seen because they know they are used for that, right?、Uh, so they need to charge their phones. Like if I watch a movie, next day I have to go and charge their phone again because otherwise I have no movies for the next day. Uh, they have to pay money to go get it loaded with with、uh, with the movie.、Uh, so it's really like they may never actually use it for texting, but it's an entertainment device,、uh, and everyone has phones for that reason. It's the first technology they've ever used and accessed,、uh, and it really fills in all the things、uh, that people need.、Um, you know, like the Facebook acquisition of WhatsApp.、Uh, we do business with people in Africa, and these are companies,、uh, and we use WhatsApp. Like. When I talk to people on the street, they have smartphones, but they don't know what email is. They're like, "What is this email thing? What's your WhatsApp number?" Right? WhatsApp is what you use. That's your identity. That number is your IP or whatever. Um, and um, there are just some numbers, right? Twenty-five、uh, percent of income you're spending on energy、uh, when you live in a situation like that. I don't spend twenty-five percent of my income on on electricity. That would be crazy, right?、Uh, but that adds up to thirty-six billion dollars a year. Uh, same with access to information. You're again using 20% of income just to get internet, right? Or 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 texting, or things like that. So how do you get out of the poverty cycle if you're spending that much money、uh, on just the basic things? And on the other side, this is,、um, you know, like you guys have ever been in a power out? You know that cell phones still work, and they work because cell towers have backup energy, and that's a huge again industry. Uh, where uh, diesel is used、uh, as a backup generator,、uh, diesel has issues. You have to actually send someone to all the places where the cell phone towers to top up the diesel, and diesel gets stolen. And there's all sorts of random things that happen. Solar is actually、uh, more reliable and actually works much better. So things like that, commercial scale projects、uh, are you know really switching to solar as well for that reason.、Um, And here are some reasons why solar energy is actually better than some of the other、uh, sources that people have now. This is an example where、uh, you can see、uh, the house on the right has a kerosene lamp, and the house on the left has a, a solar light.、Uh, the light that we use at home for reading is 150 lumens. That's that's reading light. That's standard reading light. 10 lumens of light, you cannot read. Like you can read, but you really cannot read. That's what people are doing. Like when they actually get access to light, that's why you cannot study. That's why you cannot get good grades. That's why you cannot do any of the things.、Uh, but if you have a solar light, which costs the same,、uh, you get 100 lumens of light, and you can charge your phone at night. Right? It's wow. <laughs>、um, there's a lot of aspiration built into. Like this is the house we went to, where、uh, 
I personally don't like fluorescent lights, uh, like these uh, tube lights, but um, they're seen as a status symbol. People want them. So even though these are LEDs, <laughs> they still want them to be like that, which is very interesting. Um, solar is cheaper. It is, you know, the economics work out to be cheaper. Like the kerosene lanterns, um, you can use 10 months of kerosene money uh, to buy a solar system that would then last you seven years, right? Uh, it's just that you don't have 10 months of money up front, so you never get out of the cycle. Uh, or, or all sorts of different projects, eventually solar on, in the long term turns out to be cheaper than the other source of energy. Uh, it's also become reliable. Uh, that was kind of the issue. Uh, when I first thought about it, heard about it, I was like, I was a skeptic on solar because I had heard a lot of bad stuff about it. Uh, it's changed a lot in the last few years, and we can look at some of those numbers, but it's a lot more reliable, a lot more cheaper, and technology keeps getting better. Uh, it's at the point where you don't have to care about solar. If you just want good electricity, you just go solar. That's kind of how people think. Um, and as we saw some of these things, it is truly life-changing. It's not just replacing a kerosene lamp with a solar system. It's about creating a systemic change uh, for people. You start over the cycle of, you know, you start with not having kerosene lanterns. Now you are saving money. You're getting something better. Your aspirations go up. You are getting better uh, through other means as well. So overall, you know, as people progress, they go through, wow, I can actually have a computer. I can have a television. I can have a radio. I can iron my clothes, stuff like that. Right? It starts a whole system. But there are some things. So, you know, people are using fossil fuels. Solar is better. Uh, then why isn't just everyone doing it, right? Like, why isn't everyone just switching? It's happening. It's happening, but not fast enough. And what are the barriers for that? Uh, it's capital intensive, as I said. Somebody has to put money in up front for that switch to happen. This is uh, one of our customers in Uganda called Solar Now. And I chose this picture to show that you just don't show up there uh, to do good and drop some solar systems and leave. You need to be there, right? You are a company that's based in Uganda. You have offices. You have Genius Bars. This is a Genius Bar, by the way. You know the Apple Genius Bar? Mm -hmm. That's what this is. Something's not working. You show up here. They replace it for free. Because reliability is really important. Just because you don't have enough money doesn't mean you will put up with bad technology, right? I want my light to work. Otherwise, I'm going back to my kerosene lantern. So uh, this requires cost, and these companies spend money to be there. Um, and the payback time, you know, in the U.S., if you're doing solar financing, if you've ever done like a rooftop solar here or thought about it, uh, with government subsidies, with all the incentives and the, you, being able to sell your energy back to the grid and all that stuff, you're still looking at 10-year payback periods. But here, without any subsidies or any kind of um, external intervention, just based on pure economics, it just takes one to three years for solar to pay for itself. Um, Banks. Banks hold the money, and banks should be financing this stuff, but they think it's too risky because banks are lazy lenders. They want to lend against uh, assets. That's kind of how they think, right? They're like, what's the security for this loan? What's your credit rating? What's this? What's that, right? So, uh, well, if you have a million dollars of land, we'll give you a million dollars of loan. So then, okay, then anyone can do that. So, um, so they're considered too risky. So all of our customers don't have access to capital, even though they're profitable. Banks don't think they are, um, they are safe investments. Um, microfinance is kind of starting off with the lower end of things, uh, but you're looking at hundreds of billions of dollars needed in this space. You don't get it through microfinance. So that's kind of where we come in. There are some trends, right? Energy demands are increasing. This is an example of a lady who um, has a solar system that powers a TV and everything, and now she wants more, uh, so people are you know, getting better off. Again, like Gates' letter from last year said that we are better off as a world than we used to be. People are getting better. Poverty is you know, re reducing, so energy needs are gonna go up. Um, all of our customers have huge unmet capital needs. People are, you know, we have successful businesses, we have done 10,000 villages, now we want to do a million households, we need $10 million, and we don't have it. So, um, so that's where we kind of come in. Um, and solar is getting cheaper. This graph just ends in 2011. If you extend it more, you'll see it's even cheaper. And you guys have heard a lot about like the battery technology that's getting better too. Storage is actually the, like the other problem which is getting solved now. The solar panels are like already quite cheap. Um, so these are kind of a good way to like uh, Carl Pope from Yale. He kind of just puts these uh, four numbers, which are four words, which really kind of frame what we do as a company. 
So the economics, the morality of the whole thing, the development um, opportunity, and the fact that we all truly believe that it's a game-changing thing, uh, just enabling this ecosystem, and that's why we're in this business. Uh, so that's what we do. What we do is um, we basically fundraise and we lend. That's what we do. We raise money from investors of all types, and then we lend money to companies of all types. We are for profit. We, we give a return back to the investors that we raise money from, and uh, we uh, charge an interest rate to the companies we lend to. It's just like a bank. Uh, this is just some background on our company. Uh, we are a startup based in San Francisco and Tanzania. Those are the two places where we have offices. I'm the only one who's kind of up here in Seattle because uh, I like it here. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, you agree, right? Um, uh, and uh, we, we, ra we recently raised two and a half million dollars from, uh, from Kosla, who is, you know, Sun, Finder, Sun uh, Microsystem founder and the Schneider. These are electric companies and foundations that have invested in our company. So that's the equity. Um, uh, kind of uh, demystifying some of that for people not familiar with startups, uh, equity money is what you use for, um, for your operational expenses. So that's what we do. Our equity money is raised by these private investors. They have a lot more downside and a lot more upside. If we do well, then they make a lot of money. If we go under, they lose all their money. Right? That's how equity works. That's a risky investment that they do. Uh, that's not our business, though. That's just how, what every company does. That's every startup. They need equity money to continue working. Um, Debt money is uh, just investments, like when you actually invest in um, uh, some sort of a product where you are given like an assurance that, okay, you will make 8% return on your investment. There's no downside if the company goes under, your money is still safe. So this is the part where we do a lot of our fundraising. So this chart that I showed you here uh, is the debt fundraising that we do. Um, and then, of course, you have grants and stuff from, uh, from places as well. Um, these are our customers. Um, just a slide to kind of show you that these are real businesses which are profitable all over the world, that uh, these are maybe 20. Uh, you have about 15 or 17 active customers. There's 100 more that we still haven't worked with. That's the kind of companies they're working with. Uh, and that's a team. Uh, I included this slide to kind of call out. Uh, if you look at uh, the section on the right, um, you'll see we all have very different backgrounds. Um, I, I might be the only person with like a technology background. Uh, so. Um, uh, you know, like uh, Rand, who is the founder, he was at Wells Fargo doing solar finance in the U.S. And Audrey was, you know, doing, um, uh, she was the founder of Good Magazine and doing some international development work. And she's the one who moved to Africa to set up our business in Africa. So uh, it makes it very interesting. Uh, I, I really have always believed, and I know that all of us kind of know that to some extent, but innovation only happens when you bring people from very different backgrounds together. Uh, and, um, and I see that every day in our company. It's like the fact that we cannot even communicate on the same vocabulary is interesting. Like when I say developer, any, any developers here? Okay, so you know a developer, you write code, right? And uh, you make websites and, you, and write apps and stuff. You know what Ryan thinks when I say developer? He's like, oh, that's a guy who buys land and uh, makes solar projects. And any, any solar developers here, <laughs> right? <laughs> So <clears throat> it's always a challenge, right? It's always interesting because you're always forced to have a very different perspective on things. You cannot just assume things. You have to like, wait a minute, what do you mean? Uh, wait a minute, what are we doing? It's really fun. Um, here's a closer look at what I mean by the solar company that we work with. So here's an example of um, uh, RT Energy, which what they do is they buy products uh, which are manufactured and they just distribute them. So this is a light that they uh, have bought off the shelf you know, and then they distribute them into villages so that people can use them. This is light which uh, is actually really good design. We can go into that why this is a good design. It's a really awesome product. You can attach it to your hand so you can walk around with the light. You can put it on a table so you can get like light at night. Um, and uh, it's just like, it's very reliable. The wires are thick, the rats cannot chew them, like all this kind of stuff, right? It's gone through a lot of iterations and it's a successful product. Uh, so people want them. Uh, so. Technology is not really an issue when it comes to this. It's really distribution, uh, which is a big problem. How do you get these lights to people in a way that's sustainable and profitable for everyone to do? So that's why a lot of companies, all they do is distribution, because that's, that's the value they bring. Uh, and then there are installed systems. This is an example. I kind of showed this picture before. But here, this woman has a panel on her roof. She has a car battery in her home. And then she attaches appliances to it. It's a bigger system. It's not something you attach in your hand. This is almost like flip-on switch kind of a system. 
Uh, and then you have microgrids. Microgrids are connecting entire villages to a off-grid. It's like a panel in the middle of the village, wires running into households, and, um, and that's how you get your power. You're not on like the solar grid, uh, on the utility grid. And, um, and then you have commercial size projects. These are like bigger ones like hospitals, schools, um, where you have entire rooftops which are solar. So we kind of work with all sorts of customers. Uh, and then we also work with the manufacturers themselves of the products too, like you know, making in China, we work with them like, to give them loans. Um, when we started out in the first year, we had done $50,000 worth of loans. Uh, that's how we start. Uh, we start small. Uh, then we went to 500K in the next year. And then last year we had $2 million. Uh, our goal this year is $12.5 million uh, of lending. And uh, eventually when we hit $20 million next year is when we'll get profitable. So that's kind of how we are growing and ramping up. Um, and this is really a small piece of the pie of how much financing is needed in this space. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the role that um, thinking about, you know, you know, I have a design background and I'm the chief design officer of the company. And that means that it's not like, it's not lip service. We really believe in using good design principles for how we think about a company. Uh, and I like to use a lot of those principles on thinking about how it Im impacts how you scale, how you grow, what you do, how you communicate things. So uh, I want to use this to kind of show how our strategy is kind of shaped by the taxonomy that we use to understand a business. If you were to go online uh, and search for types of off-grid solar companies, you won't find an answer. It doesn't exist. We are the people that are creating that definition, that classification. Um, and uh, so when we started out, we started out with distributor type companies. And um, just because they are smaller, uh, they need smaller loans and we can get started easily with them. Uh, as we evolved, we started doing more work with installers because the price point is higher. Um, and then we also did one microgrid project. Now this year, what we found is uh, microgrids and commercial projects are kind of the same, or, or at least they seem to be the same, right? Now the same is kind of an intuitive thing, but in the sense of similar customers, similar loan structures, similar price points, and so on. So we decided to combine the two and just create one new entity now. So we only have four, not five. And, um, and that is going to be the bigger part of our portfolio going forward because you know, looking at commercial scale projects, you need a lot more money than for just the smaller ones. Uh, so this is kind of a way how we re you know thinking about a strategy when it comes to what customers we target, what type of customers we target. Uh, same with investors. This is kind of an interesting one. Uh, when we started out, you know, if you go to sunfunder.com, you'll see we're a crowdfunding platform. You can see the products that are online, you can invest as little as $10, and then when the project gets funded and repaid, you get your money back. Uh, so we did a lot of crowdfunding. This is not donations, this is like investments and you get your money back. However, because of um, SEC regulations, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the whole accredited investor stuff, but um, it's a nightmare, it's painful. But what that basically means, the, the US government or the Fed or whatever, they think if you are really rich, then you have a right to lose your money. But if you are poor, then we want to protect you from yourself, right? So, um, so if you're poor, which means you're a crowd funder, uh, then you cannot invest in certain kind of investments. So that's why we cannot offer a financial return to anyone if you are investing as a crowd funder. We can only give your principal back. We cannot give you any money. We are generating money for you, which you can reinvest, uh, but you can never withdraw that money because, you know, if you promise that you can actually make money this way, then we know different than someone selling you snake oil because, you know, how do you trust? We are not registered anywhere. But if you are a rich person and there's a series of steps you go through to basically uh, qualify as an accredited investor, then you have access to a different investment product, which means you can actually make money and make a you know, financial return doing it. Uh, and that's fine. So we uh, had a two-pronged strategy. Most of the money came from crowdfunding because it's easier to get started that way. Uh, and, but we still had investments from the other four boxes, like on the other side. So they may seem like just a series of boxes, but there's a huge jump when you go from the left to the right, from the green box to the, to the yellow box, because the business model changes completely for the other four. Um, last year, uh, crowdfunding was a smaller piece. Now, this is a normalized uh, graph kind of a thing, so the volume is actually going up. We're just showing the relative change in each component. So, uh, yeah, crowdfunding, you know, did not, like we wish we were a lot more successful raising money from other sources. Um, so this year we expect it's gonna be even smaller. So it's still important because when we do projects which are 
uh, in new markets, new loan terms, risky. We still need uh, patient capital that comes from crowdfunding to fund those projects. But when you're talking about scaling our business, that money comes from the other sources. So um, we think, would we keep crowdfunding around? Like, wh what's going to happen? Uh, if you're a startup, the less boxes you have, the more likely you're going to succeed. Like, you don't want too much complication. You don't want different audiences. You want to find one niche that can scale and grow. And right now, we are doing two different businesses. We're raising money from unaccredited investors and from accredited investors. So it defocuses us, right? Uh, so we are open to, you know, even though we all love the crowdfunding piece of a business, we are open to thinking about maybe not having that anymore at some point in, in the future of the company. And that's fine. Or maybe the SEC changes the rules and then we can just offer returns to everyone and then everyone's the same. Um, but this kind of impacts how we think about how we're going to grow as a company. So uh, it's kind of interesting to visualize it that way. Our goal, though, is to eventually get to um, the commercial markets, which are the blue box, which means you don't have to care about solar or Africa or people. You just care about making money. And we still offer you a product which makes you money. And that's, that's the point we want to get to. Because only then you can unlock billions of dollars in this space. You cannot rely on people wanting to do good. There is not as much money there for just people wanting to do good. Same kind of progression of the geography. Our business uh, re requires us to do a lot of um, um, each country. We have a presence. We have people who know, you know, we have CPAs in every country. We have lawyers in every country. We have to check on the background of every business we lend to. So there's an incremental cost. It's not as easy as, hey, let's do Zambia and be done. Like, you really have to go there and make things work. So again, we have to go vertically down before we can grow widely, right? So again, if you visualize it, the more boxes we have here, you know that we are, we are a more complicated business. The less boxes we have here, the easier it is for us to grow. Um, now, Asia, which includes India, by the way, uh, I always grew up thinking I was Asian, like because that's what we do. Like you know, there's one billion people on the earth, like that think that Indians are Asians. So I believe I'm Asian because we are part of the continent, we are part of the Asian Games, and all that stuff. But anyway. Uh, I, I was surprised when I told people I'm Asian that, no, you don't look Asian. So anyway, so Asia includes India in this thing here. And, um, uh, and the 400 million people don't have electricity in India. That's actually a huge market. But we had to make a decision uh, to focus on the markets that are easier to go into. India has a lot of regulatory overhead. We just are too small to t tackle that right now. Uh, but our plan is to make that a big part of portfolio. We think eventually it will be like 60% of our portfolio will be in India. Uh, we just cannot go there now. Um, and same with financing types. Like every kind of loan we do, you know, we are doing inventory finance, which is a small loan, which just lets you, you know, buy a shipping container from China, arrives, you take the stuff out, you sell it, now you have the money, you pay the loan back, six months, you're done. That's a small loan for just getting inventory. A term debt is like a lease. It's like you're giving something to someone for four years, three years, and you want to be financed for four years. So it's a very different loan structure. So all of these boxes are incremental complexity for the company. So we had kind of have to you know, grow slowly uh, as we go up. And um, so eventually as we grow, and if we do well, then we will have a lot more complexity. So um, it's interesting. Like um, I'm kind of making a case that the simpler you are, uh, the more successful you can be as a company, and that's true. You know, like if you remember Steve Jobs' famous rant when he came back to Apple, like you guys are stupid. You just need four products, right? You want uh, consumer, pro, desktop, mobile. That's it. Simplify, because Apple had too many products when Steve Jobs came back, and he's like, that's why we are not successful. So why are we going uh, into complexity when we could actually try and simplify? Like my design instinct is to simplify, not to uh, actually make it more complicated. But uh, the tension we have is with risk mitigation. You know, we are doing a business which is um, we are making loans into regions which are risky. So um, the more complexity we have, the lower risk it actually gets. That's kind of the tension that we have. So you can look at an example where if we were to just raise money into a simple debt fund, that's fine, that's easy. Um, it's a simple product to design for, to explain, to communicate, and build. Um, but then you also have a lot more downside as an investor. So we have gone through a lot of different changes on our loan products that we do to kind of map our interest rate and risk appetite to different types of people that want to invest in this thing. So we kind of have to go the complicated route. So in this, in this case, the green section, if you invest in the green box, you are safer and you get a lower return. If you invest in the orange box, you're taking more risk, but you get a higher, higher return. So 
and we see different people want different stuff. Some people just want to do good. So they're like, you know what, I want the safest one. I just want to put my money into something good. Others are like, I really want to invest and make money off this. So I want to go into the risky ones. So we kind of have to embrace some complexity to kind of structure the risk. Uh, same with our portfolio. If you look at it, all the colors that we saw, uh, all the boxes you saw, this is one, this is not real data, kind of real data. Uh, but this is what a portfolio looks like. These are the different types of uh, companies that we have worked with. These are the different geographies we have been in and the different types of loans we are doing. Now, as a designer, I want this to be as simple as possible, right? I, uh, we almost have this kind of underdone rule that we should not have more than 10 colors on this thing, right? <laughs> like ever. Uh, we have used a palette of 10 most distant colors and like, hey, I don't want to be making a slide where I have to find out what's the 11th color I want to use because I want them to look different. So it's great, it's a good design constraint to have because it helps us focus. At the same time, the more complex this is, the safer our portfolio is because then we are uh, protected from if a certain business model stops working or if a certain geography, you know, if there's a, a currency risk where there's inflation in different countries and all sorts of things that happen. So the more diversified we are in the business we do, the safer our investments actually are. So that's a challenge we constantly deal with, figuring out simplification, scaling, risk mitigation. And then that kind of translates to as our, the architecture and a strategy has changed over time, our storytelling has also has to evolve. Um, you know, someone said inf information isn't like uh, found, it's what you communicate, right? So uh, we are defining this space, we are defining the ecosystem, we are playing at all parts of the ecosystem, we bear the burden to communicate what this means, to communicate what off-grid solar means, to communicate the uh, economic opportunity and why it's profitable, why it's low risk and stuff like that. So when we were initially crowdfunding and doing only distributor projects, this is kind of what a website looked like initially. It's like a prototype, just put it together, get it out there, and that's how we raised $50,000 of funding in the first year. Um, then we kind of got to evolve a little bit more. Let's, uh, another kind of thing that you notice here, initially we used people in our, in our uh, communication. What we realized is um, when we ask most people about uh, Africa, or um, like I always thought it's, it's uh, poor kids, it's uh, war, and uh, it's animals. Like that's what you think because that's what media shows all the time. It's about poverty, it's about uh, social unrest, and it's about uh, you know uh, the wildlife. <laughs> but um, but there's a lot more to it. It's really like no different than any other place, you know. Uh, and it's not all bad. It's actually pretty good. People just you know we just need um, to help more, and uh, it's an economic opportunity, and there's a lot of things going on. But it's not all bad. I was there last year, and there was no Ebola, for example, anywhere I went. Uh, <laughs> Uh, people are more scared about it here than anywhere in Africa, which is really strange. Um, so we decided consciously to move away from trying to pull at hard strings. We don't want to do that because we're not looking for donations. We're not looking for you know, feeling good about doing something. We are trying to show that this is a big economic opportunity. It's a way to, to you know, remove some inequality, uh, but it's also profitable. Uh, so we kind of moved away from not using people specifically uh, in, in our marketing and the way we communicate and just call out that here's kind of what's going on. Um, and, um, and then, um, as you saw, like we're actually getting a lot more traction from uh, the other kind of investors. So we haven't even released it. This is still in the works, where our website is evolving into focusing more on just the two pieces, which is, hey, if you're an investor you want to make money, that's what you do. If you want to borrow money, this is where you click, and that's kind of the two parts of our business. And um, and you see that our uh, representation of what solar is has gotten bigger. So you're looking at uh, no solar in this picture to a tiny panel in this picture to like a huge utility scale solar project to kind of call out that this is you know not a do-gooding thing. This is really just a big industry, and it's coming, and it needs money, and you can make money doing it, and there are all these opportunities as part of it. Uh, the other thing that kind of changed was, um, uh, since this is, again, uh, something that people don't know much about, uh, I did a lot of like traveling to um, capture uh, pieces to kind of communicate uh, what this actually means, what solar actually means. So we have a lot of imagery on what these devices look like. That's Ryan and Audrey. This was in uh, Uganda. And uh, what all these things look like. There are these uh, businesses in a box that people use and uh, to charge cell phones. There's... Um, all sorts of companies and all sorts of innovation. This was a really good, like, modular uh, system where you can see that when you start off, you just put 
one battery uh, in the system, and then after a year, people are like, okay, now I want to upgrade. So you don't have to replace anything. You just come in with another battery, and now you have upgraded. So uh, a lot of like interesting ways people are designing products to work in this space, uh, thinking not just about a one-off thing, but the life cycle of the products that they're trying to sell. Um, and um, these are another genius part of another company in another country. Uh, what we found, though, is uh, this is like a microgrid. What we found, though, is that most of the in use solar actually happens uh, like it's hard if you if you just think about it think, think about it, you are a storyteller and you are in Africa and you want to show how solar works right so we're like okay let's take pictures at night because then you can show what solar lighting means and um, we have a bunch of pictures of uh, you know how solar looks at night and it's just like okay there's an LED in a home great like fine uh, it doesn't really communicate very well what's going on uh, we tried daytime pictures of like let's show panels and stuff, but all the action was on rooftops, not really on the ground. So we ended up with just like not being able to tell the story well. So we uh, decided to uh, to actually uh, incorporate a different kind of storytelling. So we started doing this is again new. So you guys are seeing two new things. Our new website isn't out yet. Uh, it'll be out soon, uh, which incorporates the change in our strategy and the aerial photography. So we spent a lot of time. I, I traveled to 11 countries last year, and. Um, kind of took a drone with us everywhere to really show um, what it's like to be in Africa, what it's like to use solar in Africa, what it's like to um, live there, what it's like to actually you know, uh, understand uh, what life is like in these places. And it's very different in some ways. So, uh, so that's what I want to kind of show, uh, to kind of end with, is a rough cut of um, uh, the, the thing we have put together to kind of show it. Uh, the drone, by the way, was a big success. Uh, with everyone, because uh, people are enjoy seeing it. So let's see. Not them. Okay. Uh, we're not getting audio anymore. On. Oops. When you need it. Okay, we're good here. This will be fun. Anyone here uh, that has a drone? All right. There is a, a new meetup in Seattle now called uh, the Seattle Aerial Photographers. Um, okay, good. So this is an example of a really small system. Some of these are also on the grid, but they still need um, uh, energy for charging phones because it's not reliable to be on the grid. This is a, a, a monthly village fair um, where everyone gets together uh, to just buy and sell things. And this company is going big in Rwanda and they're selling this uh, cell phone chargers. Uh, and they actually paid this guy to like do a concert and all that stuff to really like get the crowds motivated. Because uh, they're seeing it as a business, right? It's, and they want to sell a lot of these devices. This was a hospital, again, in Rwanda. Uh, and you can see, like, it's geographically, like, two things. Amazingly beautiful place, right? Like, this is amazing. Uh, it's also quite remote. So uh, they use solar as a backup system. This one, on you see that red box, that's one microgrid. And then on the f far right, there's another microgrid in the same village. This village has four microgrids, which are kind of connected to each other. And the 
this is actually the town right next to Masai Mara, which is where you do a lot of safaris in uh, Kenya. A lot of people here are actually in that business, right? So they actually have good economic means, but they just don't have electricity. So they're willing to pay for it, but they have access to it. Uh, this project is the largest uh, utility scale project in, in East Africa. And um, this just got done like in July last year, and then we took this in October. So it actually just officially inaugurated like last week. So all of this stuff is new, this is happening, right? And there's millions of dollars, billions of dollars that's being put into this space for that. Um, so we're kind of standing somewhere in the corner there, actually. Um, and um, this company that did this, they want to do another five such projects in the next two years, right? So, uh, so that's why they need financing. And um, when this actually pans out, uh, you will start to see that because it's the first big such project in Africa, uh, it's actually in the shape of Africa. It's kind of neat. So you can kind of see Western Africa appearing on the left there. So that's our storytelling. So to tie to our theme, like, you know, we talked about happiness today and we uh, were looking at like this threshold beyond which happiness is not tied to uh, material uh, benefits. Uh, for us, we are really working in this space where we kind of get to work on the lower side. It's easier in a way. Like when we see, we have done 250,000 uh, people now have access to electricity that they didn't have before in the last years they've been working. Our goal is to get to a million by next year and kind of keep going from there. It's easier and satisfying to see that, that change happen when you see the, the, just like, you know, not having electricity to having electricity. It's kind of a no-brainer uh, inequality thing that you can just easily understand why it's useful. Uh, so it's fun. Uh, but then there's also this whole aspiration thing that we see as a big driver of, it's not just the baseline economy of kerosene and diesel. It's the aspiration that's built in what people want. They're like, I want a better life for my kids. I want to have the comforts that I've heard about. I want to have uh, access to things I didn't have before. And that's an even bigger driver. And there's no way to really quantify uh, what kind of uh, financing is needed for that aspiration wave. But we know that that's a big part of this too. So, uh, so that's what we do. And our goal personally as a company is to we are $2 million now, and we want to get to a billion dollars in financing, uh, So, uh, which would be a very small piece of the pie of the energy needs that the world has. So yeah, uh, thanks for listening. How are we doing on time? Do we have any time for questions? Or? OK. We kind of ran over, but yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a constant like uh, tension, so to speak, when different kinds of investors are doing this for very different reasons. Um, so as we evolve our story, uh, we do run the risk of alienating some people, right? Because uh, we are, we are uh, as, as I said, like we are not trying to see this as a, a way of just doing good. We, we are at the point where uh, it's implied, like there's a social impact component to this. We don't have to make that the big th part of what we do. Like what we're trying to solve is the energy need and the, and the financial need. And we're trying to think of this as a scalable business. So, uh, so we do see um, some changes uh, in uh, the kind of investors we attract as we kind of morph things. Uh, but what we've also seen is largely any impact focused investor also wants to see the same. Like they actually want, they tell us that, okay, I'll invest in you now uh, if you convince us that this is gonna help unlock money from uh, an investor who does not care about the world. Like, so that's kind of how we're seeing. We establish a track record when we raise money, we deploy it. 
they have not had any defaults so far. We have been doing this for three years. We have, you know, we have zero defaults. So you have a really good track record. And uh, that is because you have patient money coming in from people that cared about what you're doing. Now we can walk into someone and tell them that, you know, this is a track record. So, you know, we're guaranteeing you like certain amount of uh, protection and interest rate. So people that didn't really care about solar, they're like, wow, this is great. This is a good track record. We, I'm coming in. So it kind of enables us. And because the finance company, our growth ends up by default being quite, um, uh, it's, we are not selling uh, manufactured devices ourselves. We are just in the business of lending money and, in, and raising money. So we can grow at a high scale as well. So we can just take a lot of investors in, match their investor uh, risk profile, and kind of grow that way. Yeah. Any other question? We only have one, time for one. I have another question. Okay. Work in okay. Um, you talk about design engagement for the investors. Mm -hmm. How are you doing design engagement with the fundees? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, we've done a lot of, um, we have to do, a, oh, sorry, okay. So, the, you know, you saw our, you saw the thing where we have, uh, we raise money from investors and then we lend money to uh, people that need money, uh, not people, companies. So the question was, how do we design for them? How do we like think about the other side of the business? And we have seen the same thing. Um, uh, smaller companies need a very different way, a uh, different kind of marketing. Um, and if you're familiar with like Kiva, for example, uh, Kiva is great for small amounts of money, but it comes with lots of strings attached in a, in a way that hurts, like businesses cannot get the same kind of scale money that they need because you have uh, some restrictions on end use, you have reporting requirements and things like that. Uh, when we lend money to someone in Af you know, a company in Africa, they don't have to take pictures of what they're doing. They don't have to tell us, uh, like, you know, social validation of what they're doing. We look at the balance sheet. We look at the project uh, numbers. We look at, like, as a bank. So we market ourselves as, um, uh, you know, very efficient and reliable source of capital, because that's something they care about. What we have seen is um, companies that we work with are very high growth as well. So the sooner they can get money, um, the the more they're willing to pay for it too. And other sources of capital tend to be uh, very slow. Like there, there are, there's grant money, there's all sorts of other things that's available in the space, but typically it takes too long. It can take up to a year sometimes to get a grant. And you have, if anyone has worked, anyone has written a grant, it's a, it's okay, yeah. It's a nightmare. There's, you have to check all these boxes like, why are they even asking this question, right? I'm not saying that this is, it's bad. All of that is good because the entire ecosystem needs all sorts of capital. So no sort of capital is bad. But we fit in uh, in a way where we are just very fast. Uh, we are very efficient. We understand solar really well. You know, people on our team have industry experience in solar, both in the U.S. market and in Africa. So we are kind of part of that. And... Um, and uh, so the key kind of thing has been really doing a lot of validation with the customers on understanding why did you go with us when you had just got a $10 million grant? And you're like, you know what? Because you, we can actually use the money for what we actually want to do when we get money from you. So it's kind of things like that, right? Uh, where being a startup with no strings attached in the same way helps us really um, go uh, help the companies kind of get the kind of money they actually need uh, because we understand the innovation that needs to happen better than like other sources of capital. So that has evolved as well for our company over time, how we market to them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.